this morning, so I can't roll up my sleeves. But when we roll up our sleeves and we get to work around the church, the theology behind our actions is very important. When someone volunteers over at our church's food bank or volunteers to work with the children or the youth, the reason behind doing that is very important. For example, we volunteer at our food bank because Jesus told us to feed the hungry. We volunteer with the children and with the young people because we love God and we want to share that love of God with the next generation. We serve for something. We should all be able to say we serve with a reason. We serve for God. Here we are again in Genesis, this time in Genesis 29, and we meet Jacob again, and this is one of the very first times when I encounter Jacob, when I truly sympathize with him. When I see Jacob's story and I say, who hasn't been there? He is in love. He is in love, and he is really deeply, I mean, you'll see how in love he is. It all started when he was hanging around with a local watering hole, which has a whole different meaning now than it did back then. This was literally a watering hole. They were giving their animals water. He was talking with some friends, and he saw the most beautiful creature he had ever seen come walking up with her father's sheep as beautiful young lady so often do. I guess back then. And he sees this woman who's so beautiful that when he sees her, he weeps. He, he cries when he sees her. Her beauty is so great. He's standing and talking with some friends, and she comes up, and he stops what he's doing, and he runs over, and he kisses her, which seemed a bit forward in the beginning <laughs> of Genesis 29, but apparently it plays out okay for him. He was so excited, and as it turned out, he was a cousin of, or he was related to her father, Laban. And Laban knew who he was, and Laban was happy that Jacob liked his daughter, and the wedding plans began almost immediately. Now, in the time that the story was told, those kinds of arrangements were done a bit differently than they are today. Wedding arrangements quite like the way we approach the blessed event. Weddings today involve a lot of planning. There's, there's food, there's decorations. Andrea's wedding, of course, is coming up in a few months. Uh, Elizabeth Wilkins, who is often here at the service, his wedding is coming up next year. And I suppose we could get an actual testimony from one of these, the, the mother of the bride or one of the future bride, about all the arrangements that are put into these things, decorations, food, invitations, and a dress, which is, of course, such an important part of the event. Lots to do, but it was different in this story. After meeting Rachel at the watering hole, he followed her home, and from the best I can gather, he started working around the farm. He just started helping out, doing things that I guess needed to be done. And Laban, his uncle, the father of his future bride came up and he said, is it right that you should serve me for nothing? This is where we enter the passage this morning in Genesis 29, 15. Is it right that you should serve me for nothing? And Jacob, the plotting one, as we've come to know him, or perhaps this morning he's Jacob, the forward-thinking one, says, I'm so glad you asked. Why, yes, there is something you could do. I would very much like to marry your daughter, uh, Rachel. Jacob has now met his match. Laban is a very, very clever man. And he says to Jacob, of course you can marry her. It's better for you to marry her than any other man staying and work. So Jacob did. And did he work? Seven years. <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> Imagine how many fewer weddings we've had with that was a caveat. Can I marry your daughter? 
Absolutely. Get a shovel that you can <laughs> use out back. But uh, times really haven't changed because the Bible tells us that for Jacob, the time flew by. It was but a few days. Ah, the wistfulness of young people in love. And at the end of those seven years, he was ready. He was ready. And old Laban pulled fast. They gathered everyone together for the feast. They got together. They had a big party. They had a very big party. It was such a big party, in fact, that Jacob didn't really realize the old switcheroo had been placed, played on him until the next morning. And he went in to see old Laban with probably a not too pleasant expression, what have you done to me? I loved your other daughter. Did you not get that? And it was Leah who I woke up with this morning. Laban told the irate groom, look, at this point he just comes clean. I can't marry off the younger before the older. So if you want Rachel, you have to it's very strange to hear this story to our contemporary ears. It's very strange the role and the way that Rachel and Leah are treated at this point. And more like the transaction. We work so hard to see men and women treated as equals and to, to live out that theology of equality. But the low place of these women is part of it, as part of this story is part of our Bible, and it's unfortunate. But if we read on, we will see that Leah and Rachel end up playing a very important, very significant role in the way this story unfolds after verse 28. But this morning, we're looking at the story of Jacob. What Jacob's story can teach us about God. Jacob served because he loved. And as we think about what we do, we should ask ourselves why we do what we do. Do we do it for love? Do we do it for God? Or do we have some other reason for doing what we do? I love cars. I've always loved cars. I remember when I was a young driver, yes, a young driver that we have in our midst this morning, and I remember looking forward to my first car and thinking about what that first car would be. My father and I looked at various cars. He took me out to look at cars. And, and at the time, cars were very important. I wanted one with nice lines. It had to have a certain classic feel to it. I wanted it to have a certain level of performance, obviously, because actually I have no idea why that's important because you can still only go so fast before getting pulled over, as many people find out. <laughs> but it was so important. So my father and I began looking at cars. We looked at MGs, too much maintenance. We looked at some Porsches. They were either too broken, too old, or just plain way too much. Finally, I saw a 1977 Alfa Romeo Spider, and I was in love. It was bright red with the black cloth top. It felt like you were in the cockpit of an F-15 to sit in this car. It was amazing. And my dad agreed to co-sign a bank note to let me buy this car, but he put one condition on that side. He said, you have to pay the car off before you go away to college. If you have not paid the car off, you will stay here in Rome where I can watch you and make sure you are making these payments. Well, I had a big motivation. All my friends were going to be going away to college in the fall, and I didn't be, want to be the one left at home. And he knew this motivation. I had a summer job. But I went out and I found a second job working nights in a factory. It was the 11 to 7 shift. And I don't know how many of you have been blessed with the opportunity to have done that. But it was amazing for eight hours to sit there and take a part out of this train, a part out of that train.
try and put them into the magic machine, press the two sides, it, something, it does something, it smashes them together. You take the finished part out and put it in the next bin. And you just do that over and over again. That whole new motivation to go to college as well. <laughs> I remember the week that my paycheck came and I had enough to go to the bank and pay off that note. The motivation for going to that 11 to 7 job was gone. It was absolutely gone. I was tired all the time. And I, I was so tired of doing this. I, I quit immediately. I mean, at that moment, I went in the bank, paid off the note, and went home and called and said, I won't be in the work today. That's the way 17 year olds think, also. I remember my father saying, You could look at how far you've come. You could make more money for, to, to save for college and your expenses. The motivation was gone. The deal was complete. And no longer had a reason to serve. Jacob teaches us something about motivation this morning. We have to have a reason to do what we do. If we're here at the church just for the fun of it, eventually something is going to happen. And it's just not going to be as much fun. Eventually, we're going to get tired. Somebody will say something. Something will happen. We must be worshiping, serving, following God because, first and foremost, we are in love with God. Because we love our Maker. And we want to serve the one who has made us. And as the psalmist writes, fastened us together in our mother's womb even before we were born. We should be in church because we want to worship the one who has transformed our lives and the one who continues to work in our lives, transforming us and drawing us nearer to God's self. As we worship this morning, let us be a people who serve Let us 